Hi, and welcome to this demonstration of painting Mel, a 12 inch by nine inch oil on watercolor study. Throughout this demonstration, you'll learn about the different materials used, uh, my approach for this study, and I also just wanted to share kind of some of the questions and thoughts behind what I'm trying to explore um, in this particular study um, and sort of these days with my paintings. So first let's start with some technical stuff here. Like I mentioned, this study is on 12 inch by 9 inch watercolor paper. Now, if you paint in oil paint, in oil colors like this is, uh, you'll probably know that it's not usually advisable to paint directly on paper uh, or directly on canvas for that matter, because it needs to be primed. Um, and that's exactly what I did with this particular paper. So it was a nine by 12 watercolor block which means all of the pages are stuck together on the corners so that they don't lift and curl when the paper gets wet. On that 9x12 watercolor block I applied a pretty solid coat of acrylic based gesso. So acrylic based gesso can be applied directly to the paper uh, because it doesn't have oil in it and therefore it doesn't rot the paper over time. It doesn't sink into it. It's basically like painting with acrylic paint. The benefit of priming it with acrylic gesso too is that the gesso will create an impermeable layer between the oil paint and the paper. So that makes it safe to paint on. Now I prefer painting on oil primer, not on acrylic gesso. So once the gesso had dried, I put two coats of Gamblin oil ground on top of the gesso. And once those dried, once those coats of, of primer dried, I had a surface that was ready to paint on. So it's not only more archival because you have the layer of gesso between the oil paint and the paper, but it's also a surface that I enjoy painting on. I think that's really important too. The brushes I'm using in this study, and actually for most studies that I've been working on lately, are Princeton Aspen synthetic, synthetic brushes. Usually I prefer painting with natural bristle brushes um, for a couple reasons. I find natural bristle brushes actually wear nicer over time. So they, you know, all brushes will wear, they'll, they'll wear down, they get broken down, you use them, the friction of the canvas or the paper against the bristles uh, kind of destroys them over time. But I find with natural bristle brushes, the texture that it wears down to is actually really nice to work with. It changes the brush, of course. You can't expect a six month old or two year old brush to be the same as one brand new from the store. But it wears in a way that I quite enjoy. It's almost like it evolves. I find with synthetic brushes, they don't wear as nicely. They kind of splay and the ends sort of curl, uh, which I find makes an unpredictable brush because you look at the majority of the bristles and you know expect that you'll know where they're going to end up. But then there's these little curly bits that kind of stick out and can touch the canvas or the paper, uh, your surface basically sort of prior to the brush actually touching it. And I find that to be unpredictable. I don't, I don't like it. Uh, I like having a, a good relationship with my brushes. So that's why I don't usually use synthetic brushes. Another reason that I usually prefer bristle brushes is that they have 
a well they have a natural texture to them synthetic brushes are when they're not splayed they're very predictable i'm going to contradict myself here a bit um when they're not splayed and worn synthetic brushes are extremely precise the bristles are quite uniform um, it can make a really clean sharp edge if that's what you want uh, so they're great for things like that I find for painting skin usually which is often what I'm painting natural bristle brushes have that little bit of texture and character I don't want to say unpredictability because that's not that's not quite accurate like I said I prefer predictable brushes but they have character to them and I feel like the brush adds something to the painting that I can't do on my own. It's sort of like a team effort between all of the players there. You know, me, the brush, which is what's between me and the paint, uh, the paint itself and the ground, all of those things were all kind of working together. I'm not controlling each aspect but rather selecting it carefully, selecting my teammates carefully, um, because I know that we can work well together. So that's why I usually prefer bristle brushes, um, but I'm using synthetic brushes throughout this painting and like I said, for most of my studies. The reason that I'm choosing synthetic brushes for these ones are, well, there's a few of them. Um, one is that the paintings are fairly small. Um, 9 by 12 is, is a really a small size for me to work on anyways. I'm used to working much bigger. So with synthetic brushes, they're, because they're more precise, um, I find they can give a, a more controlled result when working small. Some of the studies that I was working on were approximately, I think, four inches by six inches, like little postcards almost, not even like, like photos really. And the synthetic brushes were really great for those. Now this one's a bit bigger, but I still kind of enjoy the synthetic brushes for it. The other reason why I've been using synthetic brushes is because I'm working with kind of a I don't want to say new palette, but a different palette than I have traditionally worked with. So this palette, and I'll go into all the colors uh, very shortly here, um, but this palette is a little less natural, let's say, than what I have traditionally used. And with the inclusion of that really neon fluorescent underpainting, I almost want to create a kind of stylized or, you know, unnatural, um, I don't quite want to say illustrative because that's not really it. Um, but yeah, I guess a stylized kind of approach, less realistic and a little more intentional um, and intentionally differing from true reality, let's say. You know, taking some creative liberties. I realize true reality is a bit of a, um, you know, it's a relative term because the way we experience things is sometimes different than, than the way we just see them objectively. And I think both are very real. And I'm actually usually more interested in how we feel and how how we experience the world around us and that is reality to me not just a a photocopy you know uh, but i digress here so that's one of the reasons why i'm using uh, synthetic brushes is to create a bit of that um, hard edged you know flat values and flat color once in a while um, kind of look and feel to this work. Now with the colors, I've been using this palette off and on for a couple years now. 
And by palette, I mean basically just selection of colors. I find I'm leaning more on secondary colors. So purple, green, and orange. Um, and really enjoying the tertiary colors that can be made with them. Tertiary colors being between a secondary color and a primary color. Um, so like a blue green or a, a greenish yellow. One thing that I want to note is that the underpainting for this is uh, painted with Cama Pigments Fluorescent Orange. Now in real life, it is almost neon. It's very high chroma, um, just like day glow orange kind of. Um, and that doesn't really capture very well on, on camera here. Um, while I'm while I'm filming. Now I can turn up the saturation uh, when editing, but then I just have to turn up the saturation so much that it really messes up all of the other colors. So I just want want you to know uh, that that orange underpainting is very vibrant and it's not it's not really coming across here very well. So just, just trust that. And if you've ever used Cama uh, fluorescent pigments, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So for this painting, and for many of my paintings uh, these days, I am using Gamblin Titanium White, Williamsburg Permanent Crimson, Williamsburg Quinacridone Red, Gamblin Cadmium Red Light, Gamblin Cadmium Lemon, Gamblin, Ca Gamblin Cadmium Orange, Windsor & Newton Green Gold, Windsor & Newton Sap Green, Windsor & Newton Cadmium Green Pale, Williamsburg Ultramarine Blue, Windsor & Newton Purple Lake, and Cama Fluorescent Orange. So that is my standard palette for most of my paintings these days. I might vary the colors here and there, you know, maybe add a new one or not use one or two here. Um, but that's kind of the, the, the pigments that I reach to on a regular basis. Now you'll notice that when the video started here, there were quite a few colors mixed on the palette. Now I usually prefer to pre-mix my colors um, so to take a few hours maybe and just mix up a bunch of colors that I see I'll need in the painting. That's because I like to paint reasonably uninterrupted and I find having to stop to mix a color all the time in the early stages of the painting to be very disruptive. So I'll just mix a whole bunch and use those as my jumping off point for the painting. Now it doesn't mean that I'm trying to memorize where those colors go as I mix them. I'm always making decisions, you know, constantly throughout the painting. There's nothing that's really a formula here. And I'm also not trying to paint with only those colors, sort of like a, a paint by numbers kind of thing. Um, but really it's just about having a bunch of color that is much closer to what I need than the color straight from the tube. Now with this particular painting, I had painted two other studies um, in the days leading up to this study. And so the colors that I have mixed here um, are kind of left over from the other paintings. Because I'm painting figures, nude figures outdoors, a lot of the colors are similar. So you can see I'm mixing a few together like I'm doing right now and I'll shift them as needed. Um, but I didn't feel like I needed to mix a brand new batch of colors for this particular painting. So that's why the palette is kind of lived in, let's say. 
I kept the underpainting pretty minimal for this study. I really just started with a drawing in Windsor Newton Purple Lake. Now the drawing uh, I just did freehand and it is reasonably accurate, accurate enough, but I didn't worry about getting too finicky with it for this, this particular study. I wanted to create that sense of energy and looseness, which is not an excuse for drawing errors, um, I have to say. Um, but I, I felt fairly comfortable with this one. I had to wipe it out, I think, once or twice um, before I was, ha you know, before I had something that I was happy with. Um, and then once the outline was finished, I covered it in Cama Pigments fluorescent orange. Now both of those colors, the fluorescent orange and the purple lake, I mixed with Gamblin Galkid Medium. So I mixed the purple lake with Galkid Medium just to allow it to flow a little easier and dry faster for the line drawing. For the Cama Pigments Orange, uh, I mixed it with the Galkid Medium because Usually for an underpainting, you want the paint thinned out so it's not applied full strength. Traditionally, I've done this by adding a little bit of mineral spirits. Not a huge amount because you don't want too much mineral spirits since it will um, break down the oil that binds the pigment together. You really need that oil. But a little bit of mineral spirits is, is all right, you know, if it thins it out a bit and still maintains enough oil in the in the paint. When I first used Cama Pigments uh, fluorescent paints, I used the kind of normal amount of solvent of mineral spirits that I, you know, that I would normally use to do the underpainting. And I found that once it dried, I could actually just wipe off the underpainting like it was a powder. Uh, it was so dry and not adhered at all to uh, the to the canvas or to the ground. So I realized that solvent alone is not suitable for this particular paint because it is a bit of a strange pigment. So now I use uh, Gamblin Galkid Medium, which is a fast drying medium that acts as lean medium. Um, so it's okay to use on the underneath layers of paintings. Sometimes I'll throw a little bit of mineral spirits in just to further thin it out, but I, I don't push my luck with that anymore. And then once the pigments are dry, um, then it's ready to do the first pass. In this painting, the I did the entire painting in one pass. So what you see in this video is exactly how the painting ended up except at the very end I did a little bit of detail work on the face that I didn't film because I just needed to get really close to the painting and there wasn't a way of filming that since I was blocking it. Um, but other than that, um, what you see here is, is how it went. Now you'll notice as I'm doing the first and last pass, um, I started with the background and I'm working around the figure. Now I've tried different approaches for this. I used to paint almost like, you know, like a printer sort of line by line. Uh, so you'd be painting the background and the figure or whatever the foreground is at the same time um, and just kind of moving up the painting or down it or across it, whatever direction you want. Now, I don't know if that's the best approach um, because I think there is something to be gained by seeing the painting as a painting and not separating out background, foreground, figure, landscape, because those are all just what it means to us, right? As the viewer, it's not about what it means to the painting um, where it's just paint on canvas. Um, arranged in specific ways to look like something recognizable. But lately I have been painting kind of section by section, uh, usually starting with the background 
and it's working for me at this point. In this study, I wanted to really pay attention to colors in the background and simplify the forms of the figure, uh, simplify the detail in the background and create kind of a magical atmosphere. I'm working from a photo reference on my computer and the colors of course are always different on a computer than they are in real life or from a printed photo uh, because you have that backlit screen. So I'm not using it as a perfect color reference where I'm really trying to match, but rather a source of information and I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do with it. The reference photo was taken in Pooch Cove, Newfoundland, while I was on a residency um, at the Pooch Cove Foundation, which I will link to uh, below. And the model was one of the other artists there, um, and I know she doesn't mind me sharing her name. Uh, so it's Mel Calabria, and her work is just outstanding. So if you want to see a absolutely incredible figurative painter, uh, go check out her work. I will link to it below as well. Now we were just approaching golden hour, um, a little late in the afternoon, not, not quite at golden hour yet, and had found this beautiful shady spot uh, by a little creek, kind of. So uh, Mel was kind of stepping around on the rocks there and I really enjoyed how there was this vibrant, brightly lit, kind of warm green in the background um, from all the foliage being lit with this beautiful, you know, late afternoon light. And then these cool shadows, um, still with a bit of warmth here and there, but overall cool shadows that really subdued her skin tone as well. And I thought the contrast of all of these colors together was really fascinating. And that's something that I wanted to explore in this study. So you can see I'm really trying to bring out those greens um, Again, simplify some areas and work almost graphic, graphically in some parts uh, rather than trying to have a lot of detail. But as I'm working into the shadows, uh, as you can see right now, I'm keeping the paint fairly thin, uh, thinning it out sometimes with a bit of the Gal Kid medium. Uh, sometimes not, you know, the oil primer and the gal kid make the surface slippery enough that the paint can kind of slide around on it uh, without building up a lot of texture necessarily. But I wanted to have some richness in those shadows without putting too much information into them. The background is really an exploration of color and atmosphere like I said, creating this sort of magical feeling, this magical scene, somewhat inspired by paintings of Adrian Stein, um, also linked below, and just an outstanding painter of color and light. I also feel that it's important to edit out some information. When there's too much information in a painting, too much detail really, in my view, it kind of makes the rest of the information in the painting less important. You know, so you have to kind of pick and choose what the most important areas are because if everything's important, then nothing's important. And the color here was the priority for me. Um, getting the vibrant background with some of the gray cool skin colors that you'll see later on. So I didn't want to overburden things with a lot of detail. I also enjoy keeping paint thin in shadows like I mentioned. So in some of those darkest shadows 
You can see bits of the orange peeking through. I like doing that because it makes the color in the shadows more interesting, uh, more rich. The colors mix optically rather than physically. So I'm not mixing a color and applying an opaque layer of it. I'm applying a semi-transparent layer of paint and allowing the previous layer to come through. So we're seeing that, again, that optical mixture of colors. I think the contrast between a transparent area and an opaque area is really interesting as well. So that's something I wanted to really bring forward in this painting and I thought the rocks were a great place to experiment with that because they were the darkest darks really. Another thing that I really enjoy about studies uh, really any painting, but studies are just lower pressure in a sense, is the kind of aspect of play. You know, playing with an image, uh, a painting, and not always taking it too seriously. Not going into it thinking this is going to be an excellent, amazing painting. Um, because I feel like thinking about it in that way doesn't actually make a good painting. <laughs> really enjoying the experience of it and allowing yourself experimentation is, I feel, a much more fun way of painting, but also yields better results. So with studies, especially because I had just done a couple prior to this painting, there's such a lovely, safe, educational way of trying new colors, new techniques, um, seeing what you enjoy, seeing what you don't like too though. Sometimes in studies I try something new and I don't really like the effect, but that in itself is important knowledge. I can think about why don't I like this effect? Or how could I do that differently next time? Or is there something in that that I, I do want to pursue, but I just haven't quite figured it out? And so in this particular study, as I mentioned, I wanted to simplify some of the aspects of the background, namely the shapes. And I was also experimenting with those darkest values. In subsequent studies, I was able to kind of bring the shapes into a more solid, structured form um, and really experimented with light, lightening the dark values uh, rather than going with the transparent effect. And I think that each painting or each study helps make those decisions easier and kind of leads you down a path. So trying for less detail, focusing on colors, simplifying, all of those things in this study, I feel were successful because I tried them all and helped refine my decisions for future work as well. Now, in terms of color palette selection, I mentioned that I've been using more secondary colors lately, green, orange, and purple. Something about those colors together are really working, I believe, for these outdoor figurative paintings that I've been working on for the last couple years. So I found that I actually needed more greens, uh, even just straight from the tube, not, not mixing necessarily, in order to portray a lot of the greens that I was seeing in nature. 
but then everything picks up the colors around it. So skin especially picks up colors from the environment. That means if somebody is situated outside, we're going to see those greens or purples or blues reflected in their skin. Prioritizing secondary colors means that primary colors don't play as big of a part in the painting. I still use them, of course. You can see them on the side of the palette there. But they generally are not as present in a concentrated form in the painting. So here again, we see a lot of those purples in the rocks and in the shadows. We see the greens in the foliage. Uh, we see the orange backdrop that's going to be kind of coming through the entire painting. But there aren't really any areas of unadulterated red, blue, or yellow. There's some yellow in the lighter parts of the foliage, um, but that's kind of a greenish yellow and has a bit of white in it too, which is lowering the chroma. And I think using secondary colors to me is just a little more complex and subtle and offbeat almost. Primary colors can be very straightforward and brash almost in, in my view. Again, I'm not saying not to have them in your palette because they, on your palette, they're raw ingredients. You know, they're, they're neutral, you, you need them um, to create other colors. But in the painting, I think a judicious use of bold patches of primary colors can create a more subtle, complex work. And again, that's just my opinion here. Now you can see I'm starting to work on the figure. I really like this part, uh, this stage of the painting. So take a look at the shadow on the stomach. So for that, I used cadmium orange mixed with pur purple lake. Interestingly, I find that cadmium orange, purple lake, and cadmium green pale in varying proportions can give a wide range of skin tones. With white, again, of course, um, just always, always white if needed. Um, so for darker skin tones, for shadows, that purple lake really brings a rich dark. Um, but adding the opaque cadmium orange or cadmium green pale can lighten that purple without the use of white. So it keeps it a little darker, but also richer. It doesn't have that chalkiness that white tends to, um, to bring into a color. So for this figure, for Mel here, I'll often be using varying proportions of those colors. Again, that purple lake, cadmium orange, and cadmium green pale. Some of them are already mixed on the palette from the previous paintings, and I'm just shifting them and adapting them. Now the shadow on the stomach is quite dark, and it's also fairly warm. I wanted to keep that shadow warm because there is skin all around it. The color of her skin from her legs and arms are going to be reflected into the shadow in the stomach. And I think it's important to keep shadows on skin warm where possible. Now a cool light source will create warm shadows. A warm light source will create cooler shadows. Mel isn't really in the light here though, so you can kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> I was really just picking the shadow colors that I thought would work best, especially because shadow colors on photos are not very pronounced. They don't really come across very well. 
keeping the light temperature in mind and keeping the reflected colors in mind helps to be able to choose a shadow color if you're working from a photo um, and you can't see the shadows in person. I really like to be able to choose a color for a shadow, not to have it just be a nondescript gray. And that's something I learned from Max Ginsberg in a workshop that I took with him in 2016. It was a, a painting from life workshop and I was working on a painting of a model uh, in the workshop and he came over and looked at my shadows and you know talked about a few things that were going okay but saw the shadows and really pumped them up um, to become almost a lavender so the model was a woman with uh, kind of pale rosy skin um, sitting under a warm light so the warm light really brought out the rosy peachy tones of her skin and when max put down kind of a lavender shadow the whole thing just sang it clicked together beautifully i had used just kind of a nondescript grayish burnt umber kind of shadow and you know it was fine but it wasn't anything special but when he placed the lavender next to the peach each one of them looked better it really enhanced the warmth of the light mass of the skin colors and created a beautiful decisive shadow that reinforced the light temperature as well so that taught me to choose and look for a color that you can name in a shadow not just kind of grayish brownish whatever you know um, but really a color that looks like something you could describe and I think that makes skin look more lifelike um, particularly skin and I say that only because that's what I generally paint um, but this is true for everything really so don't ignore the shadows um, really think about how can you make color that will look good against the light areas that works with the temperature of the light of the light source and also makes the painting feel real even if the color is not accurate based on what you're seeing you may not see a strong lavender color let's say in a shadow but if you try it or think about well if it's a warm light then it makes sense that we'd have a bit of that kind of purple blue in the shadows then try it out and see how it goes sometimes the shadow colors are hard to see and like i said photos tend to really gray them down and make them look quite drab but that's not the way we experience viewing lights and shadows and so if it feels kind of dead and off whether it's accurate or not is irrelevant if the experience and the believability and the feeling of being there is missing you know what I mean being accurate is not as important as being emotive and believable now as I'm moving into the lighter parts of the figure it's not a lot of it's not really a lot of direct light it's kind of diffused light and reflected light that we're getting so there's a lot of blue in it because the sky is blue so her skin is picking up on that and that's something I wanted to explore in this study it was really having these skin colors that I hope will feel believable even if they look kind of strange at first 
with these cool lavender blues, they're going to look extra strange because they're on such a warm, vibrant underpainting. So a cooler blue will look extra cool and blue and gray, really, when held up next to an orange, like this underpainting. Now, that's an important thing to notice because it might affect your judgment of color. While that orange is still largely visible, and there's still quite a bit of it showing, it's going to throw off the color relationships. And we tend to see color as relationships, um, not individual colors on their own. So when putting down the kind of lighter lavender blue colors that are along the back and just at the knee here, it really looks jarring against that orange and it's so easy to second guess yourself right to put down that color and say well that doesn't look like skin like there's no way it can be that color look how terrible it is you know she looks sick and pale that's just a temporary state and that's why I think it's important to do some pre-mixing if you have the time and the opportunity. To be very single-minded, almost focused on the colors that you see and that you want to include in your painting. And then don't second guess them too much until the underpainting is covered. Then if you see that somehow you've gone astray with the colors, absolutely go ahead and fix them because then you know the relationships will be correct since the underpainting won't be as visible anymore. Another helpful way of checking to see if the colors are working the way you want them to in you know, this middle stage where there's still an, a lot of underpainting showing, is just to block out the areas of the painting that are still showing the underpainting. So just block out the underpainting with your hands and kind of make a little window or, I'm doing it right now as I narrate, but make a little window or show yourself just a little corner of the painting where you don't see any underpainting and see how it clicks together. It is truly remarkable how colors can look so strange initially, but they really click together at the end. I think it's important to make good decisions, you know, do your pre-mixing, try to see the color as objectively as possible, or make decisions about the color that are well thought out, that are deliberate, um, intuitive as well and then trust yourself trust that you're on the right track don't second guess what you've put down unless you're absolutely certain that it's incorrect once the first pass is done you'll be able to make a much more informed decision this is also, this whole concept is also one reason why I like to paint the background first. Uh, is because while the background is important, of course, the figure is really where it's at for me. If I paint the background first, more of the underpainting is covered by the time I get to the figure. And I have a bunch of colors already against which I can compare the skin mixtures. So I'm not making decisions in an uninformed way. When starting a painting, that's when you have the least amount of information, right? Because it's all underpainting at that stage. There are no other colors to compare to. It's 
So at that point, we really have to do the best you can to make the colors accurate. And I mean accurate in terms of what you want them to be. But it gets easier as more underpainting gets covered. Now, of course, if you want to paint in a la prima style, uh, painting all in one go, which is what this is, generally there is no second pass. So you're making decisions on the fly and that's part of the appeal. That's part of the freshness and the spirit of a la prima. And I think that's really exciting. Again, accuracy is not everything. Once you've reached a level of technical skill where you can paint and draw accurately, I think that is very important and I'll get into that soon too. But once you've reached that level of skill, what are you going to do with it? That's where the big question is. What are you going to do with that skill? And that's where your own style and voice and sense of expression starts to develop. And there's so many ways of doing that. One can go more abstract or hyper-realist or sort of painterly realism, painting in plein air, painting the figure, working only from life, never working from life. Like there's, there's so many ways and there are no rules. So I really encourage my students anyways to learn the skills and techniques so that you can paint or draw basically what's in front of you. Everybody might do it a little differently and that's, that's a good thing, but that you have the technical skills to render what you want to render. And then we learn to dig deeper and look at your own motivations, what you want to paint and why, what color and brushwork and value decisions and compositional decisions you're going to make and why. You know, why do they best express what you want to communicate in this painting? And again, sometimes that is just intuitive. It's not always easy to articulate, well, I chose this color here because of X, Y, and Z, right? Sometimes it's just an intuitive choice and that's what you felt was the right thing to do. And that's good enough too. Sometimes that's even better. Now I know a lot of art schools kind of since the modernist movement have put technique to the side. I think that this coming back, there's definitely a resurgence of technique um, and of private ateliers as well. And I'm glad to see that. Um, but technique was really yeah, put aside and not seen as important and seen almost like it got it gets in the way of art. But I don't think that is true at all. So many BFA and MFA programs are focusing on concept. I think concept is very important and technique is too. That's the thing is they're both important. What do you want to say and how are you going to say it? Personally, I feel like too much emphasis on either technique or concept doesn't really produce the best art. There's of course exceptions to that all the time. And again, this is, this is just my opinion. 
but that's why I teach technique um, in my instruction and in my online classes and my coaching. Um, but I think it's also essential to understand why somebody wants to learn how to paint and draw and what they want to be able to say about that and what kind of paintings are they attracted to? What kind of tendencies come out in their own work? And can we listen to that? Some people are more exacting than others. Like handwriting, basically, we all have characteristics. Everybody's different in that way. So really looking to kind of enhance that character in one's drawing or painting is, I think, really important. Because really, with enough time and instruction, pretty much anybody can learn how to draw and paint. Um, so what's going to distinguish your drawing and paintings from anybody else's? It's, it's you. It's the you-ness that you bring into it. Your own background and personality and dreams and regrets and interests and fears, that's all part of it. Now, in this series of paintings um, that's been ongoing for me since 2021, approximately, it's kind of late 2021, I would say, I've been focusing on paintings of the nude figure outdoors. Um, sometimes an individual, sometimes two or three people, uh, women uh, primarily. And throughout these paintings, I'm exploring different topics and kind of relationships, I would say. Now, if you're familiar with some of my previous work, uh, you may know about a series I did uh, from 2014 to about 2017 uh, that I titled Gaze. And that was all about turning the model's gaze back towards the viewer. Um, really kind of unpacking the viewer's gaze, really keeping in mind the male gaze, keeping in mind, I mean, having a rebuttal to the male gaze, uh, a response, a flipping it on its head. And having that eye contact with the viewer was essential. That was a very deliberate part of those paintings. I think with the nude figure, particularly the female figure, there's just such a long history of painting women in such a way that there's enough nudity, but not too much nudity. And the viewer can kind of look all they want because nobody calls them out on it. Um, it's It can be objectifying. It doesn't really take the humanity of the model into mind. Now, for me, painting the female nude is, that's my subject. You know, there's no thing nothing more worthy of my time and effort. But I needed to find a way to do that where I felt I was changing the narrative, let's say. But I did that for several years and I'm glad I did. I think they were really effective, um, but it doesn't mean that I need to stick with that, right? Um, I think a specialization can feel really grounding 
Uh, it gives you focus. It makes it easier to talk about the paintings because they have a common theme. But at a certain point, for me anyways, it became more of a series of constraints. Now with this painting of Mel and others in this series, I'm looking at these quiet, intimate moments, sometimes on one's own, like in this situation, um, sometimes with friends and lovers and maybe ambiguous relationships. I think there is a vulnerability in a sense to being nude outdoors. You know, you're not in the protective space of a shelter of some sort. And it also is very natural in a sense too. There's nothing there that's human made, it's all nature. So I kind of like both those aspects. But coming across a quiet moment like this where we don't get the sense that the viewer is even part of it, right? The figure does not know the viewer is there. We are not part of the scene as the viewer. There is no recognition or breaking that, that fourth wall kind of. And so it becomes a picture more than a relationship. The painting becomes a picture more than a relationship. That puts us as the viewer kind of in a voyeuristic position, which I think is really interesting because in a lot of my previous work, I was trying to avoid having the viewer be a voyeur. By positioning the model's gaze back at the viewer, they weren't really allowed in a sense. So to experiment with this, you know, with portraying the model and not having the direct gaze brings up a lot of questions for me. Can we even create paintings of nude women not looking at the viewer and have it not be a way of objectifying them? And I believe that it is possible. Um, and I know that for me, it's important to paint women with our full humanity. At the same time, I didn't want to be boxed in by these rules that I created for myself. I think it's important in art and in painting to be comfortable with that gray area. That art doesn't always need to answer questions, but it can just ask questions. For me in these works, I'm asking can I portray these vulnerable, intimate moments with the nude female figure and have it seem sort of sacred and touching and maybe alienating in a sense, having the viewer know that they're not supposed to be there, maybe uncomfortable in some ways. You can't control what the viewer experiences though. So I think it is important to really listen to yourself. Keep in mind that the painting will be viewed by other people. So it doesn't need to be so personal as like a diary entry kind of thing. It's, it's that, that balance between like the ultra personal 
and something universal or if not universal that other people can relate to and experience and when i said earlier that we have to balance the technique and the concept know what you want to say in your work and know how to say it i don't mean that each painting needs to have a message to me that's too simplistic and it makes a painting kind of a social campaign more than a piece of art a painting should be more timeless in my view than a social campaign because politics change over time and it can look very dated and very of an era to have work with a very clear social message doesn't mean that there can't be aspects of that social message in your work i'm not saying that at all but just that i think it's okay for a painting to ask questions or to sit in ambiguity and that can be all that you want to say rather than some you know clear message and story so in these works for me it's about exploring intimacy and vulnerability you know what it means to paint the nude female figure our relationship with nature and then just bigger themes of regret and love and mortality joy sorrow all of those things I wanted to bring all this up and just kind of talk candidly with you here um because we spent quite a bit of time talking about technique about color palette selection grounds and priming how to approach the first pass alla prima all of those sorts of things and those are all hugely important but again that that why and the the emotion behind the work is what makes it more than just an exercise so i wanted to share a bit of my motivations behind the work but back to the technique for a moment you can see how now that most of the figure is painted we really get a sense of how the colors click together and i just found that coolness of the skin against the vibrancy of the background to be so fascinating now i know i've mentioned this before in this video and in other videos but i really believe in the importance of doing studies or even just smaller works that feel more casual if you don't want to call them studies concepts are honed over several paintings i believe and one painting cannot be everything and it need not be everything working with studies allows the body of work to become more well-rounded and i believe takes a bit of pressure off of the individual paintings we're not going into it thinking that this is going to be a masterpiece um it's really just about fleshing out ideas trying new things and building this kind of continuum of paintings each one can feel precious but it really isn't 
I think about it sort of like bees uh, in a hive, how an individual bee is certainly important and necessary for the hive, but all the bees together are what make up the hive, and then the hive itself is really the organism. So all of these paintings kind of make up the organism of an artist. And the paintings don't have to be big or substantial, they can be quite simple. One of the reasons why I started working with watercolor paper uh, for studies was because it felt more casual. And I still really enjoy that. Sometimes when working on a proper canvas or linen or whatever ground you usually use, it makes the painting feel a bit more formal. Like usually there's more prep involved. It's often quite costly. Um, it sort of feels like, okay, this is a real serious painting we have to make here. Uh, but when working on kind of cheap or easy materials, I think it takes away a lot of that pressure and actually makes, annoyingly, for better art. I kind of wish it was the other way around, but um, in my experience, it, it hasn't been the case anyways. So if there is a, you know, an easy, cheap material that you are happy working on, um, I believe that it's important to, you know, get some of that and just practice, put together paintings that may not go anywhere, or maybe they will. Maybe you'll like some of them so much that you make a more formal version of it. And so that's why I return sometimes to these watercolor paper studies is to keep that freshness and ease in mind. I think translating that to a bigger painting is where the challenge is. Some of that ease is so appealing and so hard to do on a bigger scale and with more formal, let's say, supplies. And working really small too, and again, like I said before, nine by 12 is, is pretty small for me. Unless you have very tiny brushes, just the size of the brush means detail is really difficult to achieve. And I don't actually have many really tiny brushes. Um, and I, I don't want to get any because I like the lack of detail in the, st in the studies. On a larger painting, though, it's easy to get a smaller brush and just get right into that detail um, just because you can, even if it's not the best choice for the painting. So in all of this, you know, technique aside, I think some important areas that that I'm exploring and that I hope will be useful and important for you as well is to think of these questions that you want to explore not necessarily answer but just kind of poke around in and sit with them for a while just sit with that ambiguity don't worry about finding an answer or providing an answer or having to get it right just think about living with the ambiguity and uncertainty and you know how does that feel can you put that into a painting or over several paintings you know over time think of each painting as being part of a greater whole so that the the weight of the world doesn't rest on one painting 
and on you know your performance in it I think it's important to paint art for art's sake that it absolutely can and should if I could use the word should um, it's it's a word I try to stay away from but I'm going to use it now um, have some of your values in it and your painting should be part of who you are but it doesn't mean you need to always paint from the heart you know you can paint from a character's perspective or from the darkest part of you or or the lightest part something really happy that's that's okay too more paintings is more important than better paintings i really believe that spending ages on one painting when you're trying to learn which is probably you know our entire career as artists i think spending ages on one painting changing and correcting it is not as productive maybe valuable as making more paintings some paintings just because of their complexity and size require a long time of working on them and that that i think is different than fussing with one and changing it all the time now i've been in that situation before where there's a painting I worked on for several months and it went through many iterations and at a certain point you do just have to walk away from it and say no it's done whether you show it or not <laughs> um, at a certain point it's done because if you repaint the entire thing eventually it just becomes a different painting and if I'm going to make one painting into an entirely different painting, I'd really rather just start fresh if possible and not have the energy and you know paint texture of the previous one leaking into this new painting. So really more paintings I think is better than spending a really long time on one. Studies are great for that. I hope this has been a helpful, informative, uh, hopefully entertaining uh, painting demonstration. There's no clear point that I wanted to get across, more just a sharing of the process, the thoughts behind it, a bit of technique, and hopefully there's something you can take away from that and bring into your own studio and your own practice. If you are looking for more information on techniques and learning more about oil painting, I do have several video courses available, self-guided, self-paced courses, uh, and I'll link to those below. And I do an art uh, coaching, sort of mentorship coaching support, um, where we can go back and forth um, in an asynchronous way to help you further your art practice and develop it um, whether you're starting out as a beginner or whether you're more advanced and looking for um, kind of conversation and bouncing ideas off of off of somebody off of me um, so link to that as well below um, but otherwise i'll leave you with this and hope you can enjoy the rest of the video um, one thing i wanted to mention is just that I didn't film the very last part of painting the face um, only because I needed to get really close to the painting. I think I mentioned this at the beginning of the video but just wanted to reiterate it. Um, and I, So I was blocking the video camera as I was painting the last bit of the face. Um, so you won't see that but you'll see the rest of the painting process. Thanks so much for watching this. 
Um, do let me know if you have any questions about this painting or teaching, uh, any technique stuff, uh, concept, whatever. Let me know if you have questions. Please feel free to leave a comment and happy painting.
Visit NicoleSleethAtelier.com for art courses, demos, and more.